All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of PyTorch Community Voices. My name is Suraj, and I'm your host. I'm also a developer advocate and developer at PyTorch. Um, joining me uh, as co-host is Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Jessica, are you on mute? And uh, okay, is my guest? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, we can hear you again. Okay, hey. I'm back from the dead. Yeah, I think I had an external mic connected, so I, I think it had some issues connecting. Um, but hey, everyone, I'm Jessica. Like uh, I was saying, I'm also a developer advocate here at Facebook. And I think Saraj was introducing our guest. Yeah. Uh, today uh, we are joined by Ludovic, who is the author of Ardell Structures. And RL Structures is a library to facilitate very easy RL research, reinforcement learning research. And um, let's bring him on. Hi, Ludovic. Hello. Hi. So I'm Ludovic. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm a research scientist at, uh, at FERM, Facebook. And, uh, and previously, I was, uh, I was professor at Sorbonne University, which is one of the, of the big universities in, in France. And my background is deep learning and, and deep reinforcement learning. So nice. Well, yeah, with, with that, yeah, welcome again to the show. Um, and we're yeah, very excited for you to speak on this topic. Uh, so for those who are watching, uh, maybe new to the show, the format of the show usually goes uh, Ludovic. Our guest will do his presentation um, about his library, about a 20-minute presentation. And then throughout that time, if you're watching, please type your questions in the chat. Uh, so so that afterwards, uh, we'll be able to ask ask those questions to Ludovic. So with that, are you ready to do your presentation? Yes, yes. All right. OK. Yeah, so, yeah, so today I will present this uh, RL Structures Library that we wrote with uh, Daniel Rotermel, uh, who is a re uh, research engineer in, uh, at FAIR and, uh, and myself. And the objective is to provide uh, some new tools to facilitate the uh, implementation of reinforcement learning algorithms. And it is mainly focused on reinforcement learning research. It is right now not for production. So um, uh, as I was saying, my, my background is uh, uh, both in deep learning and deep reinforcement learning. And actually, uh, when you do just deep learning, I mean, without sequences of actions, uh, using PyTorch, for instance, it's quite very easy to, to implement new models and new, ID, uh, new ideas. And, and the way you do it, basically, is by implementing a training loop. So you define a model. So your model will be a, a, neural, ne a neural network. Then you define your data set, your training data, or maybe the data on which you, you will evaluate your model. Then you have this object in PyTorch, which is a data loader. So the data loader is basically a a multi-processes object that will load uh, your data very, very quickly. You have your optimizer, so stochastic gradient descent, for instance, and then you have this training loop, which is basically at each epoch, you load, you get a new batch of data uh, by using this data loader. Then you compute, oh, there is one missing line, you compute a predicted uh, output with your model. From this predicted output, you compute a loss, a loss function, and then you compute the gradient of this loss function and you update the parameters of your model. And basically, if you do a computer vision, if you do uh, NLP, if you do uh, question answering, you will always, at least in the supervised learning setting, you will always have this notion of training loop, which makes things very easy to understand. So if you take the, the code of some, someone else, it's very easy to identify this training loop to see where the model is defined, where the data loader is defined, and then to make modifications. And the magic of, of deep learning with these types of software is that if you want to change your model, then basic, your, yeah, your algorithm, you will basically change the architecture of your model, but the learning loop will, will, will be the same. So it, it's very simple. You just change the architecture, maybe you will change a little bit the loss function, and that's it. No, uh, when you do uh, reinforcement learning, uh, basically, 
you are facing a completely different setting because you don't have data, model, loss function, you have an environment, you have an agent, and this agent is is doing actions over the environment. The environment is providing a reward function, an observation, and then the agent has to learn how to act into, into this environment. So basically, when you switch to reinforcement learning, you have the, the feeling that it's a complete different world. So everything you know about this learning will be different in reinforcement learning. And this is true also when you look at classical uh, reinforcement learning platform. So these are examples of different reinforcement learning platform, but very quickly, okay, you have this abstraction about creating an environment, creating an agent, then you have the, the loop in which you will execute multiple action, which will be mixed by this gradient computation. So it's very complicated to understand what is done where, and if you want to make mod modification because you have an ID, Depending on the on the library you will use, it, it may be very difficult to, to 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 find where to do the modification and how to do the modification. And basically, if you decide to take one one library, you have to learn how to use it, and it can be very long. And all libraries have a different philosophy. But actually, reinforcement learning is not very different. Uh, than supervised learning. So what we are trying to do with this RL structure library is to implement reinforcement learning algorithms like we are implementing supervised learning algorithms. So basically, we want to have training loops in reinforcement learning, and this is the, the focus of, of this RL structure library, because we, we think that if we have training loops, it will be very easy for people to identify what, where and what to modify if they have an ID. And this second, object also is that we would like to to make reinforcement learning more friendly for people that are not used to do reinforcement learning so basically if you take one computer vision researcher and you 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 ask him or her to switch to reinforcement learning it will be completely different but if we are able to write reinforcement learning with training loops like we are writing deep learning then maybe we will facilitate the adoption of this uh, family of techniques by a researcher from, from other domains. This is also the, the, what, what we expect. So uh, what do we want to, to have at the end? We want to keep the same philosophy, so we want to be able to find a model. In that case, it will correspond to uh, the neural network that is in your agent. From this model, you will define an agent. You will define your environment. And then we have this object, uh, which we call a batcher. And a batcher, the idea of the batcher is to replace the data loader. So in supervised learning, you read data from disk to compute some loss function. In reinforcement learning, the data comes from interaction between agent and an environment. So you have this agent, this environment, they will interact, they will generate a trajectory of actions and observation, and then you will compute a loss on this trajectory. So the role of the batcher is to to, to give you a way to easily access to this uh, to this data and potentially with multiple processes so to access to this data at scale. So if we have this batcher, then we can write exactly the same of training loop, but instead of getting data from the data loader, we get trajectories from a batcher. Then from this trajectory, with, with trajectories, we can compute a loss. And then we can compute the gradient of this loss and update the parameters of, of our model. And this is really what we expect to achieve with RL structure. And you will see that we are close to this type of uh, writing of uh, RL algorithms. Uh, one difference is that in supervised learning, your data loader is always sampling data uniformly from your data set. Uh, in reinforcement learning, your batcher, which is simulating this interaction between the environment and the agent, the way it will sample data depend on your model. So you have one more step to add in your training loop is the fact that if you are updating your model, the parameters of your model, then you also have to update this batcher such that the new trajectory trajectories will take into account the updated value of the parameters of your model. But that's it. But what you can see is that it's very similar to, to supervised learning. So if we are able to write reinforcement learning like this, it's good for us as RL researchers because it will be easy to make modification by modifying the loss function, the architecture of the model. 
and it will be also easy for people that are not doing reinforcement learning to start to do reinforcement learning and to attract people in this uh, research domain. Uh, so RL structure at the end is just a very small library providing this mono and multiprocesses batchers as the replacement to data loader and which allows to execute one agent and multiple processes over one environment. Um, in addition to this batcher, what we have to manipulate is trajectories, so traces of interaction between the environment and the agent. So what we provide also with the RL structure is a data structure that can be used to represent complex trajectories, so comple complex traces between agents, uh, interaction traces, sorry, between uh, an agent and an environment. So basically, RL structure is two stuff. You have one data structure to encode this sequential information that you will get through a batcher, and the batcher will be in charge of collecting this information at scale, uh, at scale. And then you can take this data structure, compute your loss function, and do whatever you want. Um, so just a first to, 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 to go into a, a few details, just a, a first slide about this data structure we are manipulating. So in RL structures, it's called a dict tensor and temporal dict tensors. What we try to do is to keep it as simple as possible. And basically, between your environment and your agent, you are exchanging multiple information. So you can have structured observation, reward. Is it an initial state? Is it a final state? And the action of the agent can be also complex. So we are what we will do is manipulate dictionaries of tensors. And then if this dictionary, if these tensors are organized in time, then it is stored into a temporal dictionary of tensors. So very quickly, a dict tensor is just a dictionary of tensors, where, as in PyTorch, the first dimension is the, dim is the batch dimension. So you have three vectors of size 5 for x, three matrices of size a times 2 for y. So this is the first data structure, very simple. And then temporal, temporal dict tensor is the same stuff. So you have a dictionary of tensors. But here, the second dimension correspond to the time dimension. So you have three vectors of time five organized among 10, ten uh, time steps. So a temporal dict tensor, it's a batch of sequences of tensors. These sequences can have different lengths. So you can have uh, sequence zero is length five, sequence one is length 10, like the pack sequence in, in PyTorch. So in addition to that, in a temporal dict tensor, you can also access the length of each sequence in this temporal dict tensor. And you can also access a mask that will be used to, to mask computation when you are doing computation and uh, on sequences of different lengths, you will use this mask to, to just compute uh, where you are really have values in these sequences. Okay, so this is the first stuff we define in RL structure. Then I will show you how we can use this to implement a very simple uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, which is reinforced. So I will not enter into the details about how we compute this reinforced loss, but I will just show you the different steps to implement reinforcement in a RL structure. Um, what you have to define if your policy or your agent. Uh, in RL structures, we have this RL agent class and all the policies you will define will inherit from this RL agent class. Uh, this RL agent class is not representing one policy. It's representing a policy which is acting on multiple environments, on a batch of environment uh, for each step. Okay, so this is so you can use parallelization, GPUs, to compute multiple action uh, over multiple environments at each time step. Uh, what we need to define is, uh, OK, what will be the input of such a, a, an agent? The first input is what we call this agent info. I will show you an example later. But basically, the idea is that you can parameterize your agent. And for instance, you can use this parametrization to say, OK, I would like to execute my agent in a stochastic mode, in a deterministic mode, 
It can be the epsilon value when you are implementing an epsilon greedy policy, or it can be also a way to implement multiple policies in one agent. And I will show you an example later. Then at each time step, you have to define this call function. And this call function will be will take as an input a few variables. So one is the observation you will receive from the from this from the environment. So it's a batch of environment. So you will receive you will receive a dictionary of tensors because you can maybe receive multiple okay structure observation composed of multiple tensors. So you have a dictionary of tensors that you will receive an observation. You have the current state of your agent. So the state of your agent, for instance, is uh, the latent representation when you are doing recurrent neural networks. So it can be whatever you want. It's a, also a dictionary of tensors representing the state of your agent at time t. You will eventually receive this agent info information um, that will control the behavior of your agent. This agent info will come from the user. It's not coming from the environment. It will come from you, the epsilon value of an epsilon greedy policy. And then you have also have access to the whole history of the agent. It means that your agent not only has access to the observation at time t, but is also able to read everything that happens before time t, so all the observation before time t, all the action before time t, all the internal state before time t. So the agent has access to the whole history of the trajectory, which may be useful when you implement complex policies like uh, transformers-based uh, policy, for instance. Um, and then, as an output, you will output two values, one which is the action, which is a set of tensors that will be sent back to the environment and then the updated state of your agent that will be used when you will call this agent again then it will be the new state of your agent and this is basically okay the class you have to define to implement a policy and uh, as i will show you you can define multiple policies in this in this way here it's just a, a simple policy based on a neural network for reinforce. So you have two neural networks, one for computing the probability of action, one for computing the baseline. Then you basically do sampling. If your agent is in a stochastic mode, you sample actions. If your agent is in a deterministic mode, then you take the argmax uh, uh, over the probabilities. Uh, then, once you have created this agent, what you want to do is to create your environment and your batcher. So creating this environment is just like creating a gym environment. Okay. Uh, so here it's based on a gym environment and we have a wrapper to wrap gym environment into RL structures. And then what you will do is create this batcher, which is a core object of RL structures. So again, the idea of the batcher is to simulate the interaction between multiple of a batch of environment on one agent on multiple processes and potentially on CPU or, or GPU. So this is a little bit complex. You have a lot of arguments. This is something we are not completely happy uh, about right now. But basically what you have to define is the number of time step you will execute your agent, the way you create your agent, the way you create your environment, the number of processes on which you would like to to spread this uh, this batcher, the seeds, so the seeds of the environment and the seed of the agent. This is to control reproducibility uh, because you are you may have a stochastic environment or a stochastic agent, so you can control the seeds to to ensure reproducibility, and then eventually the information you would like to to give to the agent or to the environment. Okay. So you create this batcher like creating a data loader, and then you can use this batcher to sample trajectories. So here it's the training loop. You have your training loop, and then instead of calling this data loader like you do in supervised learning, you are calling your batcher. So in reinforce at each epoch you want to restart from the beginning to sample new episodes so you will reset your batcher 
you will send the particular information to your policy. So here I will reset my batcher and say to the agent, I would like to execute you in stochastic mode. And then you execute your batcher and the acquisition process, the acquisition process will start in all the processes. And then at the end of this execution, what you can do is get the resulting trajectories. You can get these trajectories with blocking true. So in that case, the process will wait until this trajectory has been computed. It can be also completely asynchronous. You can have this blocking equal to false. And in that case, you can continue the acquisition while doing some other computation, which may be useful for uh, evaluation of policies. So you have your trajectories in this temporal dick tensor data structure. And then on these trajectories, you can compute the loss you want. And this loss is quite easy to compute because in this trajectories object, you have all the observations, all the actions, and also all the states of your agent during the acquisition. So you can compute, I don't know, uh, mean square error over uh, the, the expected cumulative, uh, the discounted future cumulative reward and, and, and your baseline. Okay, you can compute many stuff. Very quickly, uh, this is the loss computation in reinforce. I will not go into details, but okay, from these trajectories, I will get all the the reward that has been sent by the environment. I will comp I will mask this reward because I have trajectories of different lengths and so on and so on. So I can compute my reinforced loss in, in a few lines. And then I do backward optimal, optimizer.step and I update my, my parameter. Okay. So if you just have a look at all this code, basically the implementation of, of reinforce is, uh, is maybe, uh, I don't know, but maybe 60 or 70 lines of, of, uh, of Python code, so which is quite short. And again, you have this training loop. So if you want to change this loss function, you know where to modify, and it's very easy to make your modifications. Um, so there are in RL structure some, some other features. So one is that we are taking care about executing only what we need to execute. Uh, you have this possibility to execute batcher in non-blocking mode. Uh, you can access the whole trajectory, so you can implement transformer-based policy, for instance, which may be difficult with other platforms. And then we are providing also some tools uh, to to replay an agent over a trajectory, for instance, if we, if you have a replay buffer. Okay. Uh, what is important is that everything you do can be done on CPU or GPU. So it's very easy to have one batcher working on GPU one, one batcher working on GPU two. And then you do your loss computation on GPU three, and it's very easy to have this kind of parallelization schema uh, in RL structure. Um, just another example, but uh, one or two slides is just to show you that what is important also in RL structure is that your agent uh, class is not representing one policy, but potentially multiple policy. Because when you execute your batcher, you provide this agent info variable to your policy and this information will be read by the agent and used by the agent for computing actions so if you have a problem like implementing diane which is diversity is all you need which is a, a unsupervised reinforcement learning model where you are learning not one policy but multiple policy uh, simultaneously it's very easy to implement this model in uh, in rl structure because you can use this agent info information to provide a policy index to your agent, such as the agent. So you, maybe you are executing your agent over a 32 environment, and you can, for each of these environment, provide a different index, such that you will execute different policies on different environment, and all this stuff will be parallelized, and you can execute your policy on all these different policies on different environment at once, just by doing one uh, batcher acquisition. Uh, so if you want to move from reinforce to Diane, basically you have to change a little bit your agent. You have to execute your batcher with the right information. This is what is written here. So you will choose how to sample policies before executing your batcher. And then you have, of course, to, to 
to change a little bit your loss function, but by changing maybe 10 or 15 lines in reinforced, you are able to implement diversity. This is all you need. Okay, so to, to summarize, so RL structure is a small library, lightweight library, uh, uh, that is providing two, two tools. So one is a base, which is a simple data structure to encode uh, interaction information between policies and environments. And one class, which is a batcher, which allows you to simulate this interaction at scale on multiple processes. So, but if you use these tools, then you are able to write all reinforcement learning algorithms by using training loops. So it really facilitates the way you implement reinforcement learning algorithms. And also it allows you to write all reinforcement learning algorithms with the same coding style. Also, if you are doing hierarchical reinforcement learning, if you are doing unsupervised reinforcement learning, then you will write everything like you like deep learning by having a, a training loop where you get data, you compute something, a loss function, and you compute a gradient over your loss function. And basically, we have example of implementation in the library of many different reinforcement learning algorithms written like that. Uh, so I think also it's a good library for teaching reinforcement learning. Uh, in addition to this library, we provide also a set of algorithms. So we, I don't, remember, so we have PPO, we have DQN, SAC, uh, A 2 C. Okay, some algorithms we have written in uh, in RL structures, uh, and also uh, we are providing a simple way to execute multiple experiments on a cluster and uh, using TensorBoard to to log the results. So okay, you can take RL structures. You can reuse our algorithms if you want, but you can also just take your structure and implement your own algorithms uh, because the algorithms, the logger are in a, separ in a separate part. And really the, the core of RL structure is very small uh, and, and you can use it in, a, in many different projects easily. Um, so we, ha we have released uh, version two in January or February, I don't remember. Uh, based on the um, first feedback we had about the library. And then what we are planning to do is to release a new version, which will be simplified. Uh, and I think it will be released next, next month. So you can already have access to this library here. And also you will see on the GitHub that there is a link to some tutorials I have written on Medium. So there is, there are, I don't remember, maybe five or six tutorials explaining step by step uh, how to implement simple and then complex reinforcement learning algorithm with uh, with RL structure. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Ludovic, for that uh, for that uh, presentation on RL structures. For those of us who are joining us now, we have Ludovic Denoyer from Facebook Research, who just presented to us about RL Structures, his library, to make reinforcement learning research easier again, or friendlier again. So um, we have a few questions in the chat, but keep them coming in. Ludovic is going to be answering them for us. and. Uh, I'd actually like to start with a question that I had, Ludovic. Yeah. You you mentioned that in reinforcement learning, the agent and environment defined data loading, and the comparison with uh, general deep learning, deep learning in PyTorch is we just have data loaders, and that's why we use batchers in RL structures. Yeah. Yeah. This is really the um, so. It's a uh, okay. So, One way uh, to see, yeah. Sorry, please go on. Yeah. So, so yes, when when you so so if you start from supervised learning, you have this idea that you are minim minimizing kind of loss function over a data set of a, okay over a distribution, and you have a data set which is representative of this distribution. So you will sample uniformly in this data set. Then the next step in supervised learning is also to control the way you are sampling data. So for instance, if you do a boosting, 
uh, or if you do active learning, then actually you try to develop models that will sample data differently in your data set because you want to, to have more focus on com complicated data points, for instance. And then reinforcement learning is, is one more step, is exactly this. You, you are controlling the distribution of, of your data because you have a policy and this policy will interact with this environment. But then you will also control this with a temporal with, with temporal dependencies, so with, in multiple time steps. So if you start from supervised learning and you want to make more complex supervised learning, naturally you will do reinforcement learning because right. you will you will modify the way you are sampling data. Right. Uh, and this is why I think that reinforcement learning is not is okay. Uh, supervised learning is one particular case of reinforcement learning. You can you can say this. okay. So if so, I can take the batcher and simulate the data loader. With the data loader, I can simulate the RL structure batcher. But with the RL structure batcher, I can simulate the data loader. And so it's more general. But I can also do supervised learning with RL structure. Yeah, this it is. seems like the batcher is the data loader on steroids because it's able yeah. to dynamically adapt the data uh, based on the environment. Yes, this is the ID. So it's um, so and and so it, it's it's not uh, it's not new. I mean, uh, it's known that okay, basically when you write a reinforcement learning loss, it's like writing a supervised learning loss, but you control also this data distribution. Uh, but then historically, people have in mind this notion of environment policy and then you have trajectories so we have in reinforcement learning this complex vocabulary and naturally the way you, we code reinforcement learning is by developing abstraction on top of this notion we have in mind uh, and it makes everything more complex but if you go back to supervised learning and take the same concept we have in the supervised learning it, it's it's easier to have uh, to have reinforcement learning uh, platform. At least this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to really bridge the gap between reinforcement learning and supervised learning by saying actually we can have tools and this is what I expect. We can have tools like PyTorch allowing us to do reinforcement learning and supervised learning in exactly the same framework. We don't yeah. need to have specific tools for reinforcement learning and specific tools for supervised learning. You can cut the two exactly the same because actually it's, it's the same problem. That's awesome. That, that really is bridging the gap between uh, conventional supervised learning in PyTorch and just making that same paradigm easier to apply when you're having a reinforcement learning problem at hand. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, what, yeah, uh, what I expect is that if you, if you show to people, you know, um, the success of PyTorch, for instance, is because with one software, you are able to show to people that Actually, you can do a lot of stuff easily because you have this software. Yeah. Uh, and this is, this is one, one of the reasons of, I was doing machine learning 20 years ago and I was coding all the model by myself. Uh, and we were only a few guys doing that. And I know you have this, this lot of people doing deep learning and it's also due to the software. It's not because the models are better, it's because we have software allowing us to, to do it quickly. And if we are able to do it quickly, we are able to translate any ID we have quickly. So you have a lot of new IDs because you have this software. And in reinforcement learning, we are not in this state. In reinforcement learning, we have classical algorithm, platform implementing these algorithms. But then when you have IDs, it's very difficult to, yeah. to it's still very difficult to implement these IDs. But if we are able to bridge this gap, then for reinforcement learning guys, it will be easy to translate IDs to code. And for people not doing reinforcement learning, it will be easy to think with a sequence of actions instead of thinking their model as I have a model with input and output, then they, they will be able to think as a model taking sequences of actions. So I expect computer vision people and NLP people also to start to, to explore new ideas because they will have this tool that will make everything simple. Uh, okay, going from the ID to the code will be simple. So it will open the mind of, of, yeah. of, 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 of this is what I expect. Hmm. Yeah. I, I really like that point. Yeah, Jessica, go on. 
Oh, I think I was going to just echo that, that like you're saying, you're finding like the, the intersections between the two and you're like making it easier for, for one to think in the mindset of the other, almost like expanding like the, the classical learning um, experience. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to um, maybe take, take that uh, abstract and kind of look at it at a concrete level. Like if someone is watching, like what are, what are um, situations that you've either used before or seen before where using RL structures is a good good idea? Like what are like what would be identifiers for someone looking at their project? Like is this a good good one to so, apply? Right, right now, I think that okay. So, I mean, if you are using already uh, some other platforms, I don't know. I can I can see a lot of platforms in Dopamine, OpenAI Baseline, all this very nice platform with benchmarking algorithms. Then you have no reason to to move to RL structures. I mean, uh, I think it will be a waste of time. You have a tool which is working, and then, and that's it. So no, I think that the um, the first target, and, and this is also one of the reasons I, I wrote this library, is because uh, okay, when you have interns, when you have new PhD students, when you have students, okay, people starting to do reinforcement learning, then uh, since RL structure, the way you write RL algorithm in RL structure is close to the way you write supervised learning algorithms. I think that the adoption is easier with RL structure than with some other libraries where you have to completely understand the new abstraction you have in these libraries here you still have this concept of training loop so it's it's it, it looks it looks familiar for people that are not used to, to make reinforcement learning uh, so this is i think the, the first target the, the second target is even in the reinforcement learning domain uh, if you take very very nice libraries uh, Usually, these libraries have been developed for one particular setting, which is a classical reinforcement learning setting, where you have an environment, a reward function, and you want to maximize the reward. But then, if you are facing some, let's say, exotic settings, it can be um, reinforcement learning with structure actions. It can be reinforcement learning with complex hierarchical policies. It can be reinforcement learning without reward. Reinforcement learning with multiple environment. Then I think that RL structure is, is is has more freedom degrees because it's it allows you to simulate whatever you want. So you don't have this constraint to use this type of environment. So I think the the second target is also when you are facing some yes exotic uh, let's say exotic um, exotic uh, reinforcement learning settings. And in that case, I think that RL structure may be a good choice. I think that's definitely a strength that RL structures is not opinionated in what setting it is being applied to. And uh, yeah, it is just opinionated in the fact that you want to get this interaction traces easily, whatever right. it is, hmm. right. and then do whatever you want with these interaction traces. For uh, those of us who are joining us now, uh, we are talking to Ludovic about RL structures. Um, he is taking questions from the audience, so please put in your questions in the chat. And Jessica, I think you had one question uh, that you wanted to ask Ludovic. Um, well, I, I think you kind of touched a little bit on it already about um, just now about is this useful for someone um, like just starting out with um, with reinforcement learning? Kind of, it, it's pretty open, um, so yeah. it allows that flexibility. Um, yeah, about the flexibility, I, I, want, I was wondering, um, are there any specific cases when you want the batcher to be blocking or and versus when you don't want it to be blocking and when it's more um, asynchronous? So, so, so in many algorithms, you want this batcher to be blocking because when you ask for data, you want this data. Yes. Uh, but then well, one recurrent problem you have in reinforcement learning is when you implement an algorithm, at some point you want to evaluate the quality of your policy. And you usually what you do is that then you stop learning and you launch your policies over multiple environments to compute the average uh, reward or performance of your policy. And this step of evaluation, it can be very, very long, time consuming. So in that case, for the evaluation, it is interesting to launch in non-blocking mode. So at each iteration, you will 
launch in unblocking mode, and, and then if it's finished, you will save the, the performance of your policy and relaunch. But during oh. this, during this acquisition of trajectories, your learning process will continue. So you will have in some processes, and maybe on one GPU, one particular GPU, we'll have this evaluation at high speed. And then you will have the training in some other processes. I, I want to bring in a question from our audience. Um, Tyrone wonders if there is an option to tune exploitation versus exploration. I believe that might be something that the agent can be programmed for. But do, yeah, do, so what do you think? Yeah, this problem of exploration versus exploitation is um, it is a character. So it is a characteristic of your policy. Uh, so, for instance, you can have this epsilon greedy policy that will take uh, random action at, at, with a particular probability. And the way you control this policy is by using this agent info variable I, I, I show in the, in the slide. So you have the the possibility to parameterize your policy with some values you decide you choose. So typically, uh, the amount of exploration, you can choose it while training. Uh, but then it, it, it depends on the way we implement this, the policy. It's not in RL structure. In, it, it's in the way we implement this policy, and uh, uh, which will require information. Thanks for that question, Kairam. Um, let's see. So I actually wanted to ask you about uh, Facebook, sorry, the use of RL structures within Facebook research. Um, I, don't, I forget if you mentioned it before, but uh, so this is a project that's inside Facebook research. Um, and can you talk about how it's used within Facebook? Like what have been some applications? So it is used, so right now it is used mainly to, to, test, um, to test IDs. Uh, so it is used at, as, a, as a research library, let's say, to, to make experiments and write papers. Uh, and it is used as a library, um, uh, yes, to, okay, for, for different projects that are, that are completely heterogeneous. So we have people using it to learn multiple policies simultaneously. We have people using it to to do unsupervised exploration in complex environment. We have people using it to do meta reinforcement learning. So, so it is used, yes, as, as, a, as, a, as a tool for research. And it is mainly used by, uh, as I was saying, by, by, by interns, by new students, by people that need to have tools to do experiments, but that don't want to spend too much time on all these very complex framework you find on the internet. Uh, there is also um, something which is strategic. I mean, it's the fact that if you have multiple people working with the same library, then you are developing a kind of uh, common knowledge of the way of using this library. So this is also what we are trying to achieve with our structure, is to have something simple. And many people working with it, such that they can discuss together, improve the library, and. Uh, and uh, and, uh, yeah, and use this library in different projects. But but really, it is used in different projects of different nature. And I think this is important because it shows that this is a library you can use not only for solving Atari games or, or, or chess, but really for, for doing curiosity-driven research. When, when we speak about Facebook, the first thing that comes to mind is scale. And in your presentation, you mentioned that RL structures can be used to scale up um, reinforcement learning experiments. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we can use multiple models and policies. But you also said that we can use multiple environments in, uh, in an experiment. Uh, can you, can you s speak a little about that? Like, In what cases do you have multiple environments uh, that you're uh, running an experiment on? So typically, if you do, uh, for instance, multitask reinforcement learning, so you want to okay, you want to learn to drive a car, so you have a simulator of car, but then you have many different cars. You want to drive, uh, I don't know, Mercedes, and and you want to drive a Formula One, and okay, you have all these cars. So they have different dynamics, and you want right. to learn a policy which is able not only to drive a Formula One, but which is able to drive all the different cars. So and then this will be in the dynamics of your environment. So you will have 
basically, let's say, one environment per model of car you, you are learning to drive. So this is uh, typically the, the use case we have to, to run these batchers over multiple environments simultaneously. It's oh, okay. multiple variation variation of this of this environment. It's kind of similar to Koopa's question about being able to use RL, uh, sorry, use RL structures perhaps to in a game where you're you know teaching a car to drive. Um, maybe this is more of like a simulation, um, but I think that's an interesting situation you're talking about. Probably. So so. Um, so I was professor in a university a few years ago. Okay, I am still professor, but I am not teaching anymore. But I have some colleagues that will uh, use, uh, I expect, RL structure next year to to teach reinforcement learning. So we we will see if it is a good idea at scale. Uh, but yes, I think typically, um, again, uh, if you if you have this sandbox where you have a car and road and you want to learn to drive the car. One first thing you can do is do it by imitation. So by imitation, you will have one picture, and in this picture, you know that the driver is turning left or right. And you can learn a policy by using supervised learning. So the first stuff you would like to show to the to the student is that they they can use supervised learning. And then you will have to explain then yes, but if you use supervised learning, you learn to turn left. But if the model is making a mistake, then you will be out of the road. And then he does not know what to do. And in that case, you have to choose the action depending on what you expect about the future. So you have to do reinforcement learning. And look, by using RL structure, you can take exactly the same sandbox. And you can simulate this on multiple time steps. So you can update your algorithm to take into account the expected future of your agent. So I think that, yes, for teaching, it's a, it's a good example. You, you can. OK, if I had to teach uh, next year a new uh, reinforcement learning course, I think I will do like this. I will start from supervised learning. I will show why it does not work in this case. And then I will try to do reinforcement learning. And if I have a library which allows me to do supervised learning and go to reinforcement learning, that it will be super good for the student to understand. And I think RL structure can help to do, to do this here. Almost meta. It's like you're training, <laughs> training the <laughs> the curriculum, <laughs> training yourself. Yeah. 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 So thanks for that question, Kula. So we are almost at time. I do want to uh, leave us with an answer from Ludovic about what he thinks uh, is one of what, what. What's your favorite part about PyTorch? Uh, what is a feature that you find very useful, and is there something that you would want to change in PyTorch? Uh, <laughs> it's a tricky question. Um, so no, okay. What I like in PyTorch is that it's like everybody. I mean, it's okay, the, the autograd mechanism and the fact that it's very easy to yeah, it's very easy to compute gradient. So you can okay. Typically, again, it allows you to to write this complex model with always the same algorithm, iteration, gradient computation. And then you can do everything in this setting. And you can just, when you have ideas, change the architecture of the model. Um, so then there is there are some stuff that are missing in PyTorch. So typically, uh, <laughs> this notion of time, this notion of sequence, it, it, is, not, it is not naturally in PyTorch. Uh, you have this notion of batch, but you don't have notion of time. And I think this is a, something which is which is missing in uh, in PyTorch, and and this is something we we would like to okay we would like to patch with uh, with RL structures and uh, with this kind of, of of library yeah. And uh, finally, um, I know you're deep into reinforcement learning, but is there something outside of reinforcement learning that excites you in deep learning? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I still spend um, half of my time doing deep learning and half of my time doing reinforcement learning. Because again, I, I think it's the same problem. Um, yeah, I think, okay, I think that the next step is uh, 
uh, okay, we are spending our lives to train and retrain and retrain models on data sets. And we are spending a lot of uh, energy to do that. And uh, and we are certainly wasting a lot of time. So yes, what, what excites me, the, I would expect that the next step is to have this, uh, this persistent uh, lifelong learning agent and uh, models and, uh, and, and this is a direct one of the direction i am pushing is to to see how we can change the learning paradigm and go to agents that are able to 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 have their own life and to integrate new knowledge continuously i think this is one one of the step we one of the step we have to do if we want to have more intelligent computers Something closer to humanoids. Yeah, and in this process, it is naturally time dependent. Yeah. So we need also to have platforms that are taking into account this notion of time. That's, that's a very interesting. Uh, definitely, it's something that we need. Yeah, but we don't know how to do it. <laughs> we have to find a way. <laughs> yes. Mm. All right. Um, I think we are. We uh, this is this brings us to the end of a very interesting uh, discussion with Ludovic. And um, I did see a question about um, reaching out to you, Ludovic, after the show um, about the about your repository about about RL structures. Um, so yeah, okay? it, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on the GitHub, you have a lot of uh, okay of links. If you want to reach me, we have a Facebook group, and you can okay. Hmm. Or by Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, this is unfortunately all the time we have uh, for uh, today's episode. But I think we might have Ludovic back because uh, it's just so interesting and reinforcement learning is moving so fast. And clearly, he has ideas way beyond other structures. So um, I look forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> I will come back, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay, thank you for the invitation. Mm. Thank you, Ludovic. And um, thanks. thanks, everyone else, for joining us today. We will be back next week at the same time. Um, so please stay tuned uh, to find out who our guest is going to be. All right. Bye. Thanks, everyone.